It's uh, wonderful to be here. And thank you, Frank Henschke, for organizing this with the Siegel Center. Also for giving me the great honor of opening up this truly major event for a truly great artist of our time. Thanks to Robert Wilson for being the reason for this symposium and for being the great artist worldwide on a world scale that he is. Colleagues, you too, you've all been working, so thanks for being here. And uh, above all, let me also thank the audience out there. It's very weird. I just didn't quite know when you would, when I would be actually speaking to somebody on the other side of, 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 of this screen. Now, very briefly, I saw Bob um, recent, recently, two months ago, actually, at a conference in Romania, which is one that I had been uh, an honorary um, consultant for. And uh, he brought with him The Tempest, which he had made in 2021 at the uh, Sofia in Bulgaria National Theatre. Um, let me just say briefly, I'm starting with this 2024 version that I saw. I'll go on to Mary said what she said of 2019. From there, I'll, with some references elsewhere, I will focus on Turandot, the opera, which uh, Wilson staged in 2018. And there are a few other things that I would like to do after that, including some brief reference to what I call this rather new, I think, well, well what I call the sacred music that Wilson has, has worked with as a director and designer and lighting designer. So, that's the movement, but back to back to the the Romanian uh, event. After the production, there was a sort of you know get together with people, post production get together, people drinking, laughing, chatting, talking, etc. And Wilson turned to me and said, "Maria, I wanted to ask you something." Yes, we'll go ahead. What was your favorite scene in the Tempest? Well, I pause for just a split second and I said the last and he looked at me in surprise and said oh I'd have thought you'd have liked most the first it wasn't the right moment to say well this is because you know people were coming to be photographed with Bob and all this usual sort of happy stuff that goes on in these kind of post-show events so in a sense I'm giving Bob, the answer now that I could not give him then. I'm going to read the first five pages because I want to just set the parameters of the talk. And after that, I will speak. That way I don't have to lean down and look at my text. And that way also I'll get a much better sense of talking to somebody live out there. So thank you. Wilson's The Tempest begins with a phenomenal sea storm constructed by the play of light, sound, and timing, which are not synchronized, but in counterpoint, and in counterpoint again for juxtaposition against the dark visual imagery, so as not to make the scene illustrative, but expressive by association with the event. These are foremost traits of Wilson's aesthetics in relation to which he offsets movement. To itemize them, they are construction by light, and where there is light in Wilson, there is color. Light, color, sound, timing, counterpoint, juxtaposition, association, and movement. Others will present themselves as we go. Movement in the tempest scene is stylized, which the eye discerns when bodily images suddenly appear in sharp shaped flashes signifying lightning. And these movements flash out and suddenly seem to be still for a split second. Juxtaposition like this of the moving body and the still body is also a Wilson trait. And here it implies, rather than says, the attempt the scenes seemingly many indistinct humans make, twisting in angular fashion, to steady their bodies in the violence of a ship rolled and tossed by a ferocious tempest. 
Notice that I said still body just now, whereas in fact, there is little stillness in a Wilson, for there are always tiny movements and also tiny gestures, sometimes so small that they are barely perceptible. Shakespeare's narrative component is embedded in the scene's composition, whose blasting sounds stimulate spectators to conjure up images of thunder and roaring ocean. Thus they see the sound. And this is one of Wilson's fundamental synesthetic principles. The scene suggests colossal cosmic upheaval and the devastation of the planet and its immense sonic buildup explodes into the sound of a gigantic, all-consuming wave speeding straight into the audience. Those of you who have experienced a mini earthquake, a mini earthquake's deep throat growl swelling up at top speed out of nowhere, would have recognized the terrifying, but also thrilling because this is theater, sonic revving up of the explosive wave, heard but invisible, of Wilson's score. The scene ends abruptly with a swift blackout, followed almost immediately by low light. Its overt theatricality, prodigiously powered sonically, is a metonym for Shakespeare's words, a figurative replacement of them, while nevertheless, relaying their story. Here is a tempest, a shipwreck, people stranded somewhere, which, as in Shakespeare, turns out to be an island. Wilson strips back the story, offering what could be called the gist of its essential parts. Prospero seeks revenge, Miranda, his daughter, and Ferdinand fall in love, the foolish Stefan and Trinculo drink alcohol as they plot a political coup, if braggart matter can be called plotting in anything but a vaudeville type comic ironic sense, which Wilson gives it. Ariel Demure plays the role of Prospero's fairy angel helper, another ironic touch, this one with elegance. Caliban appears, learns to get drunk, and is otherwise subordinated to Stefano and Trinculo's antics. But his role in Wilson's arrangement is really no more significant than that of the usurper Duke Antonio, Prosperous treacherous brother and father of Ferdinand, or of Alonso, King of Naples, and Prospero's former friend. Antonio and Alonso are shown in an incidental run by magic banquet sequence, attractive for its visible and visual colors. Wilson's is a short version of The Tempest, of short duration too, running only at 90 minutes, that truncated in terms of storyline, and especially noticeably of dialogue, can be argued to be as valid in its excisions of as any other short Shakespeare and there are plenty of them in the world. Saw some when I was in Romania, but none were most likely reiterated, be, but they were most likely reiterated because for instance, the line that followed in Shakespeare's text was too long for the chosen um, beat or meter or rhythm desired in these moments for the production. Sorry, I think I missed part of a phrase. The phrase, a few phrases seemed over-repeated, but they were most likely reiterated because, for instance, the line that followed in Shakespeare's text was too long for the chosen beat or meter or rhythm desired in these moments for the production. So the artistic exigency was a matter of the perceived right form rather than one of staying with the right text, the text so-called to the letter, but do we need to be reminded that theatre is not the same as literature? What Wilson is doing here recalls the representativeness, the repetitiveness in opera, where at certain points a singer sings the same phrase 
or sentence from the libretto again to exactly the same music, specifically for formal reasons, that is, the arc of the musical writing requires repetition for musically satisfactory completion. And this occurs quite noticeably in Puccini's Turandot, uh, and Wilson takes it in his stride to complete his own artistic necessity. I'm going to talk a little bit about Turandot soon. More than narrative, then, is at issue in this not immediately evident, indirect approach to narrative typical of Wilson's theatre. The production elides to its close and to Prospero alone with Miranda. Uh, with Miranda. Wilson condenses Prospero's lines, but their subject is clearly Prospero's bygone suffering and inner turmoil, and this his internal tempest is transcended as forgiveness, reconciliation, and renewal begin in an atmosphere of peace at play's end. Prospero's spiritual voyage is the core of the production, and from it come new beginnings. He la his last scene with Miranda is gently moving, and this emergent emotion together with Wilson's elision of Shakespeare's various figures clustered at Shakespeare's end, Antonio and his courtly entourage disappear in Wilson's production, opens with the space, and it opens the space for suggesting that Prospero's last scene is a legacy offered not only to Miranda, but also to all listening and watching in the theatre. The end is my beginning, wrote T.S. Eliot on his own spiritual rebirth. Wilson's focus and closure on this note of the end is the beginning is a cue to his insight into the spiritual dimension of Shakespeare's play. You can see why I could not speak to Bob about his first scene in The Tempest without speaking about the last. They are essentially two parts of the same scene, because Wilson's structure is a straight line, going from tempest to reconciliation, to light, in fact, in a continuum of the same thought and action. Further, all factors considered, the emergent emotion that I have referred to emanates principally from the actor in the role of Prospero. It comes from something in his manner from deep within him, and this sensation is sustained by the quality of his voice, a long road travelled voice that has been and seen and understood. This phenomenon of attention within is what Wilson calls filling the form. That is, you, the actor, are filling the form from yourself from whatever you are thinking, feeling, experiencing, imagining, dreaming. And if you are bored, it's going to show. Wilson sets the form to which you, like all his actors, are held down to the last of your, of the angle of your finger. But whatever it is that keeps you centered and permeates the form quietly, unostentatiously, gives it its interest for both actor and spectator. Wilson maintains that without this inner, let us call it an inner energy, the form, however outwardly splendid it may be, is simply empty. It is important for me to say, in, in anticipation of the last section of my talk, that the spiritual in Wilson's work is rarely noticed, let alone written about. Yet it is frequently there, to a lesser or greater degree, depending on the work. It was already there in his utterly innovative Einstein on the Beach, 1976. I saw it for the first time at the Avignon Festival that year incarnated in the white beam of light 
glowing against black. That took 20 minutes to rise from the floor and incredibly slowly to go into a vertical position at the center of the stage. Slowness with nothing to detract from it. Measured time while accentuating the sense of time as a palpable phenomenon and also slowly the sense of time as eternal. And all of this happened to one long note held on the organ in the orchestra pit with minor, modulation, minor modulations. That piece was spiritual without signing itself as spiritual. Now the written part is over and I'm going to simply talk very quickly because I think, I don't know if I've got time for conversations at the, for questions at the end, but I'm going to talk as quickly as I can without killing the speed can kill as we know. The um, next important work I'm going to refer to is the, 19, the, the year 2019, Mary says what she said. It came in to this period, this grouping that I'm giving you, which is the beginnings, just sort of the eve of COVID, and then two works that I will refer to are in the middle of the COVID um, pandemic. So there's a kind of symbolic significance here. This is a solo piece performed by Isabelle Huppert, who had performed Orlando under uh, Robert Wilson's direction in 1993. And the text is by Daryl Pink, Pink, Pinkney, who was also the writer of the text for Orlando all those years ago. What I want to do is pick up the thread of sound as an element of construction, because sound in Wilson also means music, and the music of Ludovic Eonardi is inter in integral to that construction made by um, Huppert, specifically with her voice. What matters here, apart from her enormously flexible voice, is the fact that here is a mass of language and the density and the mass give a great deal to its concentration. The vital importance of language needs to be stressed because it isn't always as important as it is here in this particular production. Um, what, what Uper does is to play with pace, time, direction of voice, like the direction of her movements, her walking, her pacing. Sometimes the pace turns into a canter. The overall impression is of a choreographed piece. I wrote long ago an essay in 1995 in, um, what's it called? Performance Forum, I think, a journal that was, no, Theatre Forum, sorry, a journal that was published in California in those years, in which I speak of the vocal choreography of Huppert's work and how she works this vocal choreography into the movement choreography, which is there as well as she's constantly moving to whatever she says and with whatever she says or against whatever she says. The event if we're going to talk about kind of a narrative moment, is Mary Queen of Scots on the eve of her execution by her cousin Elizabeth I. What is very striking, particularly for somebody who knows Wilson's work well, is the way in which this density and the focus, the concentration, are all ways of actually letting be felt the emotions that are in some ways related to the situation and the figure speaking and moving. This is a kind of filling in the form again. Um, and when I say emotion, let's be clear, emotion for Huppert, as for Wilson, as for myself, certainly myself speaking here about Wilson, emotion does not mean emotive. It doesn't mean histrionics, and it doesn't mean acting emotion or acting out emotion or straining emotion to make it appear. It's a very different process, this process of 
filling in the form, which the performer fills in a way that is quite personal, since we don't get into the performer's head and don't know what this person is working with. I think finally what I want to say here is that this sonorial quality of the whole is also a means for eliciting emotion, not only in the performer, but also in the spectator. And if I'm stressing this perhaps a little more than I intended, it's because there has been a long, sometimes overtly stated myth that either speaks of Wilson's work as being icy cold, or simply says that there is no emotion ever in it. I think that's not altogether accurate. Let me just finally say that I noticed thinking about this, as I've noticed before writing on Wilson, that there are very subtle shifts and changes in perspective and means. The means don't look like they're the same. In many ways, the elements that he uses artistically, those aesthetic elements, are very much the same. But the means shift slightly. And what shifts quite significantly, at least from my point of view as a spectator and scholar of Wilson, is that the intricacy, which was so fascinating in Orlando in 1993, when Huppert wasn't the famous star she is today. She was an up-and-coming famous, but now she's huge. Um, the, the intricacy was also compounded and extended by a marvellous sound score, a lot of it of breaking glass, beautifully timed as if timing was so important in Wilson, for Orlando. Well, that intricacy, where she actually stressed syllables, um, worked very strongly you know, with spitting words out, with actually your roaring them out in many ways, with just truncating and breaking the language, which was part of the fascination of that work. Here, it's quieter, it's calmer, it's less intricate. And the less intricate in this particular case of Wilson's oeuvre is a very powerful means of holding this one and a half hours, it's 90 minutes again, of solo with all the energy and concentration that Isabelle Huppert needed for it. I mentioned music, and this is my entree into talking about an area that I feel is has produced some of Wilson's greatest masterpieces. And these are the grand opera, as the jargon goes, for this kind of opera. He does, of course, folk opera. My book on Robert Wilson talks about the differences uh, of these various kinds of music theatre, as I call it in general, that he works with. But I'm choosing for this conversation today, grand opera. And my example, my first example, if I can get as far as the second one, is Turandot, the 2018 Turandot. Um, which, of course, is Puccini and has Puccini's sumptuous melodies, the motifs, the refrains, the repetitions that I talked about of singing earlier, the assertions, the humour, great humour, in which Wilson uses very wisely and, and, and very succinctly in, uh, in his production. And, of course, the multiple emotions which he follows, which Wilson follows with tremendous sensitivity. Wilson understands really perfectly clearly that music is about emotions. And music is what has to be heard in the theatre when people sing. And it's not, it's they have to hear the orchestral music and above all, what the singing voices are telling them. And to have the possibility to do this as a spectator in the theatre, I mean, if you're an opera goer like I am, you know exactly what it means. The possibility for listening and really hearing that music and the singing the, the, is, is helped when the stage is uncluttered, when the, you know, it's got, when you get rid of all the furniture and the distracting paraphernalia, the clutter of opera can be horrendous. And Wilson is also very aware that uncluttering also means spacing bodies in that space, 
particularly when it comes to the chorus, because the chorus can be just this huge brrr on the stage. And it's not always successful to have it as a brrr on the stage, particularly because the chorus never sings really on its own. It works with the soloists. It's not an addendum or an appendum. So that um, what happens in Turandot is the tremendously subtle spacing of chorus. Sometimes it looks very clearly as two parts of the stage. Sometimes it's in lines, but there's always breathing space wherever that chorus is placed. And the breathing space is also given to the soloists. So that the, the, the three main ones here are uh, Caliph, actually four, Caliph, the unknown prince who has to, who falls in love with Turandot at first sight and takes up the challenge of the three riddles. So answered correctly, it means he has her hand. Answered wrongly, he dies. We are told in the opera that there are hundreds that have died because of Turandot's uh, placing of the riddles and refusing refusing to submit really essentially to love and also to what she sees as the power and the control of men. So the spacing between um, Turandot is very, between Turandot and the other three. So it's Turandot, Caliph, the unknown prince, who goes for the challenge, uh, Liu, who is a slave and loves uh, Caliph, and Caliph's father, Tumur, who had been um, kicked off his throne and is in exile, and they meet uh, he and his son and Liu quite by accident on the eve of an execution. This is the moment just after the, just, just before the execution that Caliph falls in love with Turandot. It's not an easy story. How does one handle it? Well, I think here what we need to say is two things. The spacing, very careful, so that it is not tight, but also not too big. So it gives just enough room for what needs to be communicated. Secondly, in the same sort of bracket of spacing, is the idea of something Wilson very carefully does, particularly in this opera, is the restraint of gesture and movement. No operatic gestures. They look really, those of you who do Qigong, they look like some of the Qigong steps that I do. It is all a way of controlling wide operatic, stereotypical, cliched gesticulation. It's also a way of concentrating attention of the ears, the eyes and the heart as you watch. The other point that I want to make here is that of the voice. Music, as Wilson sees it, rightly in my view, conveys emotion, but in opera, it must convey it through the singing voice. In fact, it's really no different than the Tom Waits music song that he uses in The Tempest or the fantastic Tom Waits, Tom Waits score and libretti of uh, those great masterpieces, 1990 Black Rider and the 2000 uh, Wojciech. But here in the operatic world, it is really very important that the voice do its work. And the voice is not there to entertain you. It is there actually to move you. It is there to give you a strong emotional connection with what is happening on the stage. So the voice is essential in having its freedom so it can soar and be itself and work at its pace and rhythm, always, of course, in relation to that musical score, because there's a conductor that's conducting and you can't just go off and do your own thing while, while you are soaring away, expressing what you need to do through that voice. The fact that Wilson... Uh, restrains physical movement is vital, vital to the capacity for spectators. Again, it's the uncluttering, the uncluttering so that the spectators can actually enter into a kind of communion with that singing voice. 
Music has its massive reverberations. I won't have time to say much about that other great opera masterpiece. There are several of them, but I'm only talking about two, which is La Traviata. And I'm going to refer to it in its Russian version, the version made in Perm, of oh, was sung in Italian, but but in it was made in it was well, it went on tour from Linz, first of all, in 2015 to Perm in 2017 and to 2018 in Luxembourg, where I went to see the opera. The conductor in Perm is the great and wonderful Theodor Kurentis, and Kurentis had a magical way of working with the singer and the orchestra, so that when, uh, when Violetta dies, she dies, the music goes into silence, and it's uncanny how, I'm still getting goose flesh as I think of it, it's uncanny how you still hear the reverberations of that music in the silence. I wrote a long essay called Wilson Sonosphere in a book um, called North American, Great North American Director, something like that, published in, in, I don't know, 20 whatever year it was, 20, 2019, by Bloomsbury. So if you look it up, it'll, it'll allow you to follow through my thinking on this whole question of silence and the reverberation of music, and particularly in La Traviata. Wilson and I talk about it in the marvellous uh, conversation I had with him, which was published in New Theatre Quarterly, the journal I edit at Cambridge University, and that came out in 2022. So we're talking about the end of the COVID, although the conversation took place when COVID was still reasonably rife. That's La Traviata, knocked on the head <laughs> very quickly. Now let me just close because I'm looking at the clock on my table in case Frank does want to give people time to ask me any questions. Um, I want to close with this notion of the spirit, with a work that is 2020, the height of the pandemic, and one which precedes it by five years, the 2015 um, Arvo Peart work, which Wilson called Adam's Passion. Just very quickly. The, the Messiah, I'll start with that. It is not Handel's Messiah, but Mozart's reworking and of Messiah, reworking it to sound more apparatic than the oratorio style Handel Messiah. And probably all I can say about it, but refer you back again to the conversation with Robert Wilson in New Theatre Quarterly. All I can really say about it in this lack of time is that it is led very strongly by a solo dancer, a marvellous Greek dancer called Alexis Fusekis. And what is very striking when you watch and when you think about it afterwards is the fact that this dance really is the dance well, it's the dance of the ether. It's not the dance of the earth. The whole work is called the Messiah. So we can already see its significance for any kind of spiritual contextualization. And I would, if I had the time to contextualize for it, very much contextualize it into a new category I would add to my book now, which is that of sacred music. Music is everywhere in Wilson anyway. It's all in his dramatic stuff as well. But here, it's a particular kind of music, and it picks up this spiritual thread that I had referred to earlier. Adam's Passion, let's close with that, perhaps link it to the Messiah, because some of the images in the Messiah of a hanging tree, of a you know, rooted tree that seems to be just all the roots of filigreed lacy beautiful thing hanging in the sky is very much the idea of the tree of life and somewhere here is really a very important linkage between the spirit and humanity if i had time i'd talk about some of the last lines in turandot in which turandot tells Kalif she was not human and he tells her she's going to be now reborn Let's end it on that. It seems like the right note to end it on. Thank you. Frank, I don't know. Do you want anyone to speak, to ask? Is there time? What's happening? Someone, help.
I don't have any sound. Oh, Lord God, what's going on here? Let's just have a look. Hello? Hello, somebody. Hello. I am unmuted. No, I'm unmuted. The laptop is in here, so I think... Um, I can hear you now, but I'm unmuted and there was no sound. What did you say to press shift? Ah, oh, whatever. Neusha, shall I go on to Hal now? So wait, so the lab because the laptop is in here, she would only hear us through this laptop, not in the mic. Who's that? I don't understand, sorry. Can't hear a thing, just a voice blurred. Uh, one moment, Maria, we're going to repeat the question from the house to you. Okay. And listen, Neusha. Go ahead. When this finishes, to get on to Hal, I just go straight on to Hal. Is that right? To hear the other yes. people? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, what was the question? Maybe we take, maybe we, I don't know. One moment, one moment. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we're on time. I finished, I finished bang on the, on the dot. Um, one second, let me open the window. Um, Marcus, can you say the question again? It's about the notion of the spiritual. Yeah. There are so many different discussions like Einstein. Oh, yes. Indeed, Kandinsky, great painter, yes. Many discussions on the spiritual. What constitutes the spiritual the will to support? Is it primarily a question of form, the separation of elements? Is it a question of form, the separation of elements? But what's the question? That statements, form, separation of elements. That, that you know, we have the spiritual kind of comes into place. Where does the spiritual come into place in his work? Where does what? Where, where does the spiritual come into his in his work? Where do you see it? Where does it manifest? Well, I gave an example, the 20-minute beam in Einstein on the beach, when I said it already begins there. We see it very early in the work. We see it in the reverberations of, of, of the music and in the way Violetta dies, which I haven't had time to discuss, when she also lifts her finger to indicate the importance of love as divine. That's, you know, it's, something doesn't have to be spelt out to be spiritual, as I just said earlier. You need to see it, that's all. It's there, it's there in La Traviata, it's there in Turandot. It's not a big slogan that says this is spiritual. You asked if, you know, where do I see it? I gave you some answers. I can't, of course, hear anybody, so it's impossible to speak here.
I can't hear a word. I'll, I can repeat the question for you. And I'm not muted, so you know I don't know what's going on. Okay. Uh, in Bob's word, uh, what major changes has she observed over the decades of engaging with Bob's work? What major changes do you observe over the decades of engaging with Bob's work? Well, I gave one, which I find very significant, uh, particularly thinking about it these last weeks in preparation for today, and that is making it less intricate, streamlining it. I find his engagement with opera increasingly compelling. Um, also, you know, he started with opera. He started with Einstein on the beach, if you can see. And that's not even the beginning. There's earlier work, as we know. But his engagement with opera, it seems to me, is very fundamental in these later years of his work. His ability to shift across from the dramatic theatre, which is always done anyway, but to shift across from what he's done with music theatre and how he's built the repertoire of his work in opera is, I think, something to be noticed. It's not necessarily a major change, but it's a shift of attention. And that's, so that shift, I think, affected something like the, 19, the 2021 uh, Tempest too. It means that dealing with a textual work like a Shakespearean text is in some ways bolder, I would say. I think Hamlet was a very bold piece of work, and I think it's one of his marvellous works. But it's bolder dealing with a multi-vocal work like uh, The Tempest too, and dealing it not with it not as a monologue as Hamlet was dealt with, but as a fully fledged dramatic piece. Those are some of the, the changes that I see. I don't think Wilson has stayed still ever anyway. I mean, if you've looked at my book, you'll see that I see a number of something like six categories with subheadings. And I'm, I'm not a freak for all these kind of subheading things. You know, I don't think it's all that terribly important because in fact, Wilson Wilson's work is one long continuum. And the crossovers with between the works are sometimes not so obvious, but a closer study of them shows them to be interconnected. I think there's a kind of wholeness uh, in the work that needs to be noticed, particularly if we're going to be talking in the next few days about his legacy. Does that answer your question, Marcus? I Thank can't you so see much. I'm sorry, and I can't hear you. terrible disadvantage not to be able to hear anyone. I, I'm going to just repeat the questions. I mean, I know you had problems with sound earlier, but it's definitely affecting. Can you, sorry, can you hear me? Because I can hear you. Yeah, no great, problem. Great, great. That's fine. I'm going to repeat every question. So you'll just have to, when I repeat it, then that will be your, your signal. Okay. Um, thank you for bearing with the technical difficulty. It's okay. No problem. Thank you for bearing with, with taking the time. I don't want to run over time. So if Frank says no more, I'll say no more. So the question is, what your what was your first encounter with Robert Wilson's work? It was Einstein on the Beach, 1976, at the Avignon Festival in Paris. And it was the second, I think, Avignon Festival ever. I've forgotten. I'd have to look at my notes. It was a it was a blowout experience. I saw it subsequently, of course, as did so many people of my generation. That was my um, first encounter. And what um how did that shape um your engagement with theatre? What was the meaning of that first encounter for you? You mean for me personally, or for yes. me well for me personally? You know, I have a background in dance, so my I began professional life as a dancer uh, 
I'm a teacher. It didn't occur to me at the time that a dancer could teach dance for some reason. Asked me why. I have no clue. I wanted to teach. That was my big thing. And um, Einstein on the beach had this enormous impact that showed me the great openness of the theatre world, that it could be a thousand things. And this was one of those unbelievable thousand of things that made theatre really worthwhile. I have worked specifically, I don't, you probably don't know anything much about my work, but I have worked very much for years now on European theatre directors. And in my book, in both editions, I speak of Robert Wilson as an American European director. This is not an accident. Look at his biography, look at the works where they were first premiered, and who financed them and how they were received and how he's been invited back and the significance as we talked about in my conversation with him in that 2020 piece I referred you to. The importance held that he holds in these, in these European countries, France, who invites him on his 80th birthday, where he celebrates uh, also the Autumn Festival, which did his marvellous deaf man glance. Um, um, uh, France, which, which financed Einstein on the beach, you know, France, which financed so much work, but not only France, Italy, Germany, Sweden. We could go through Eastern European countries. The Russians, if we didn't have this ghastly war, we'd probably be having Robert Wilson back working again. His Pushkin's fairy tales is a tremendous achievement, a beautiful work. So, you know, I placed Wilson very much in the corpus of my vision about European theatre or theatre in Europe might be another way of put it. I've put it that way several times because not all theatre in Europe is made by Europeans. So, you know, Europeans, born Europeans, so to speak, I don't know whatever the right terminology here is. So Wilson's effect on me was to really show me that here was another way of looking at things. Um, much of the stuff I'd seen pre the 80s, I would say, was rather boring, very textual oriented British style theatre, which I don't like, didn't like then and don't like now. It's not that kind of theatre that I write about. I write about what I consider to be the, the, the great innovators of the late 20th and the 21st century. And Wilson, for me, is certainly one of them and one of the foremost ones. So that's the long-term answer, the longer journey from the immediate, oh, wow, part of it. When I, you know, when I was a young student in Paris in 1976. I hope that answers your question. I'm really sorry, I can't see. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Maria, here's another question. Um, I know in your Rutledge book at the very end, you even included exercises, but the big question is, is Robert Wilson teachable? You're a professor or you're a mentor, or you're a, um, a, a, someone who guides students. How, what is your experience in teaching, quote unquote, Robert Wilson? Ah, that's a fantastically interesting question. Listen, some years ago, I can't remember exactly, you know, I'm getting on in time and all the years are blurring and I'm working my ass off. So, you know, here we are. I'm trying to remember dates. Several teachers from a university came up to me at, at, a, at a symposium my students were running because I was training them how to run symposia. I thought they needed to learn how to do that and be an extra bow to their professional string. And they came up to me and said, we love these things. And they, keep, they kept coming. And they say, we think your exercises are phenomenal. We've been using them in the classroom to teach students how to act and how to move. I said I had a dance background. I'm not what I call a practitioner. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a sociologist of the theater. I'm an analyst of theater. I work very hard on following through. I mean, I've followed Robert Wilson since 1975, but I've also followed other directors from that period. Ariane Nushkin, for example, I followed all her life. It's hard going following these great directors. It's tough work. 
you know, just turn up at the theatre, you know, and it's expensive. You've got to get there. So um, I don't count myself as a practitioner, but I used to run in my university a course on movements because it's something I can do and I can do it without feeling that, you know, I just didn't know enough about the stuff to do it, to actually teach it. And some of those exercises I actually used just to heighten my students' awareness of the possibilities of moving. Moving in counterpoint, for example, which they couldn't do. Placing themselves in relation to each other in juxtaposition, which is a, a, a Wilson phenomenon, you know, very much an important feature of his work. It can work. It does work. But, it, you know, I think, I think teaching Wilson might be like teaching Stanislavski, i.e. people are going to invent a Wilson that maybe isn't there, like they invented a Stanislavski naturalist, for God's sake, who was definitely not, ne never was, and never wanted to be, and resented being caged in this way. But that was part of the um, use of how people use Wilson is going to very much depend on how closely they pay attention to what they are finding out about him. And then I guess they will have to do what they think they can manage and they will have to do how they can manage. And whether it is Wilson or not Wilson is going to be, be the big question for anybody watching. I think that is really truly what is going to happen. But the blunt answer to your question, or whoever asked you, Frank, whoever asked this question, is yes, it works. I've had people telling me, not just that particular group of, of professors from universities who used my exercises and thought they were great. Various others over the years have popped up and said, we use your exercises. Thank you. So wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we came down to the closing minutes um, of your talk, Maria. Thank you really um, for participating, um, for um, being with us. We are almost um, out of time. We apologize uh, for the technical complications. Um, we had to download a new OBS broadcast system for our partner and we are still trying to adjust it with the, within the university system, but we heard you very clearly and uh, it That's was a beautiful great. opening talk. Any last minutes? What are you working on at the moment? Uh, uh, next, of course, that you prepared for us. What is? What are you working on? And what? Well, if, can if, you, focus? if you uh, apart from Robert Wilson, <laughs> because yeah. if you yes. if you want to yes. do a book on this, I'm going to write up what I said. I mean, I've got most of it written. I just wanted to speak, and of course, when you leave your text and you speak, you risk forgetting some of the important things that you wanted to say. But that's life, you know. We have to speak to each other. I think that's fundamental. I'm also going to go back to some of my work on Stanislavski because I have created a furore really over what I've written about Stanislavski. I think it's fundamental to say the things I've said about him. Stanislavski, you'll be surprised to hear this, reminds me of Wilson and vice versa on certain points, not on all, but on certain points, and that's a fascinating discovery. So I'm going to follow through some of those insights that I've had into Stanislavski and see if I can make more sense of it, particularly his work on opera, which is fundamentally really important and exciting in the way that Wilson's work on opera is exciting, with, interestingly, quite some important connections between the two, which makes one really think, what is it about the very great artists that they somehow connect in some sort of way, if you can see the connection? Fantastic, wonderful. Well, that's the idea also for the conference to see how does it all connect? Uh, it's a rhizome, it's a network, a spider web where you pull on one edge and everything moves and there is a deep connection and perhaps it's not a linear one, it's a spiral um, oh, that goes yes. back and forwards in time and the history exactly. of modernity. And it's like brambled and it's like interlocked roots of trees. You know, got to slowly unpick them without damaging the roots and without damaging the tree. You know, but you've got to put those roots back into that earth for it to grow. It is Thank exactly you. that and that is the process. 
Good, very good. And I hope our conference will do the good thing and not damage the roots, but reinforce them and will be some good fertilizer. <laughs> Thank you so very, very, very much for preparing and to be the opening speaker. It's a great honor to have you here for our conference speakers. We will meet again at two o'clock. And there are a couple of little places outside on Fifth Avenue where you can go or again, take the elevator, go to the eighth floor. There is um, an in-house restaurant here uh, with some limited offerings, but still it's uh, in the building. So thank you all uh, very much. And uh, my, con my special thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you.